The regular meeting of the Minneapolis Public Health and Safety Committee for March 2nd, 2022 will now begin. Thank you and welcome everyone. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Public Health and Safety Committee for March 2nd, 2022. I am Latricia Vita and I am the chair of this committee. As we begin, I will note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by members of the city council and city staff as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13D021 due to the declared local public health emergency. The city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the Minnesota open meeting law. At this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this meeting. Council member Wansley Warlaba. Present. Council member Rainville. Present. Council member Ellison. Here. Council member Palmasano. Present. Vice Chair Payne. Present. And Chair Vita. Present. There are six members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. With that, the agenda for today's meeting is before us. Uh, there are three items on today's consent agenda. Item one is accepting a Minnesota Department of Health grant for COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy in the workplace. Item two is accepting the National Forensic Science Improvement Grant for Supplies for Police Department Crime Lab. And item three is referring to staff the subject matter of a signatory authority on Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Public Health Associate Program host agreements with the Minneapolis Health Department. Is there any discussion on these items? Seeing none, I'll oh, wait. Seeing none, I'll move for approval of items one to three. Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Vice Chair Payne. Aye. And Chair Vita. Aye. There are six eyes. That carries and the consent agenda is approved. Um, item number four is the first item on today's discussion agenda. Item four, item number four is receiving and filing a presentation on the Minneapolis Police Department uh, buyback program. Um, we have director Robin McPherson here to kick us off with a uh, presentation. Committee Chair, Council Members, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Uh, there's quite a few people from the Police Department who are here this afternoon to help answer some of these questions and go through the various parts of this program. And so I'll wait. I won't introduce them all now, but as I come up, we can. Um, I'll introduce them. If we can start with the first slide, the next slide, please. Thank you. I wanted to start with just kind of a brief explanation of buyback because I think maybe there is a little bit of confusion out there on what actually buyback means. So there are several components or different types of buyback and uh, they're listed in the table on this particular in slide two. Um, but in general, buyback is overtime hours worked by sworn staff that's beyond the regular uh, and overtime operations of the department. It is voluntary, so officers sign up to work and it is completely voluntary. We do not guarantee that the hours worked or the hours that are posted will all be worked. And they're funded by entities that are external to the police department, but they are paid through the MD, MPD payroll. So in essence, we invoice it, with the exception of internal departments to the city, which we'll get into later, we invoice these different entities. Um, they're primarily a con contractual arrangement if the requester is external to the city. Um, and then the MPD charges are based purely on hours worked. So there is no billing for non-worked hours. There's no profit on this. The uh, revenue that comes in equals the expenses that go out. 
So the types of, of, uh, of buyback that there are, and we'll get into these more in a couple of slides. The first one is grants and primarily federal and state funding. And that makes up 34.2% of our total buyback. Now total buyback for 2021 was 96, almost 9,700 hours. Uh, stadium and venues are a second source of buyback and that made up a 33.1% of total buyback hours. Organizations and neighborhoods made up 21.5% of total buyback hours and internal departments, meaning internal to the city of Minneapolis. And this includes primarily public works and park board. Next slide, please. So you can see in the first, uh, the first graph here on the left that our buyback has actually gone down pre-pandemic. Pre it was higher, it has gone down, and it has not gone back up since uh, 2019. And 2020 and 2021 have been relatively consistent. We do not really know what to expect for 2022. Um, I think it may go up a little bit, but I don't think it will go up to pre-pandemic levels. That's just my estimate. Um, and then again, on the right is a graph of the different types of buyback hours in 2021 uh, as a pie chart. And the uh, total hours of buyback, 9,600, is 4% of our total overtime hours in 2021. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the examples of buyback over the last 10 years, and you can see it's quite varied. Our buyback actually goes back. I ran a report for 20 years ago, um, and there was buyback in there. Uh, or I, I'm sorry, I didn't run a report. I was looking through some old contracts, and there's buyback in there. So buyback has been around for quite a period of time. Next slide, please. So if I could ask uh, Deputy Chief Waite to talk about the grants and federal and state funding. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having us here today. So I am here to talk a bit about the buyback grants that we have that are reflected in the grant work done with our federal and state partners. So again, the primary source of this funding is through the federal and state government. It's interesting to note really that the work that is done as part of these grants, it's very complementary to the work that we're already doing. It's very specific and directed to uh, detailed work that people are doing. It's not here's overtime and use it as you need. It is specific to the work that's being done. For example, when we look at uh, say the work that one of our investigators does within the forensics division. It's the Minnesota Exploitation of Children, the task force work that he does. Um, it's investigative work that is primarily done forensically through computers. And the work that he does with the state is state funded. It's on overtime, but it complements the work that he's already focused on on his day to day um, with his day to day work. Um, the rate of the work that's being done, the cost is based on the overtime with some minimal restrictions to variable fringe, pri primarily severance and variable fringe rate. So another example of some of the some of this type of grant work that's being conducted right now would be to reflect on the DWI court funding. Um, that's a year by year grant that's paid uh, and managed through Hennepin County. Uh, they're the ones that manage the grant and direct the work. Uh, it's a focus on restorative justice for a program. And what we do is we've got staff that'll go out and check on the clients that are associated with the DWI court work and check in with them, see if there's anything that they need. And they've actually developed some really nice relationships and um, it's been a very fruitful program for everybody. So I think that's a real positive for everyone involved. Um, Moving on then to the other city departments and park police. This is a source of funding that was built into um, built in through other departments and park budgets. Uh, an example of this would be the work that our staff does when it comes to snow emergencies. Uh, we've been lucky not to have too many of those this year, but when those do come up, uh, we have to support the public works in doing 
their very best to try to clear the streets so that the plows can come through, of course. And so the first day of snow emergency, we have staff that will go out into the field and write citations uh, to assist with the clearing of the roads. Um, they also have situations where we'll assist with construction and traffic and with events and security when it comes to the supporting the parks and large events that they might host. Uh, the rate is a cost for overtime and is charged directly from one city department to the other. So I'll turn it back to you, Director. So next slide, please. Neighborhoods and organizations, we have DC Forest and Inspector uh, Peterson, uh, who is the inspector of the first precinct here to discuss some of these items. Uh, thank you, Director, uh, uh, Chair Vita, and uh, other members of the Council. I am going to discuss uh, buyback as it relates to neighborhoods and organizations. As Director McPherson pointed out, um, a lot of our numbers have decreased. Some of the uh, neighborhoods and organizations that had used buyback in uh, some of the examples you've seen over the past 10 years, uh, that is not necessarily the case uh, any, any further. Um, much of what you're seeing in terms of this category uh, is uh, buyback surrounding uh, DID in downtown. Uh, and I will uh, allow Inspector Peterson to weigh in a bit on that, essentially allowing us to facilitate the joint beats that we do with police reserves, um, smaller events or venues, uh, some of the things that are going on, either be the downtown art fair, uh, Uptown Special Service District is uh, is another one that is uh, utilized. As we all know, the Uptown area is uh, somewhat somewhat on par at times with our Downtown Entertainment District, and this affords uh, that area to have a nighttime safety plan. Uh, again, events such as uh, theater events, golf tournaments, marathons uh, that are being funded uh, again by uh, by other organizations so that we can utilize resources that are off duty to help provide the public safety function that is needed. Um, JAG funds are discussed on this and I don't necessarily know uh, how they've been parsed out within, uh, within our records, um, but the justice assistance grants afford our inspectors the ability uh, to provide overtime resources to areas and problems being brought forth by the community and that also which data shows uh, are having problems in the area such as violent crime hotspots and uh, that affords our inspectors the ability to bring in additional resources and help address uh, the concerns that the community is bringing forward. Uh, Inspector Peterson, if you would like to weigh in a bit on how uh, buyback is utilized, particularly in the downtown, in the downtown. which is, uh, which is uh, I would say an important uh, utilizer of this form of buyback. Absolutely, thank you, Chief. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me. Uh, as the commander of the first precinct, um, buyback is used in a wide variety of ways within the first, first precinct. If you went back to the list that um, Director McPherson had, particularly uh, it's been used over the past 10 years for um, putting officers in the Cedar Riverside area, uh, the downtown improvement district, which I'll touch on in a little more detail here shortly, but working through things like grandma's marathon, canine services um, coming into help with event security for U.S. Bank, Target Center, Target Field. Um, I already touched on TCF Bank Stadium, the theater groups, um, Target Center, Timberwolves. Mainly uh, for those, it's um, event security, external event security, and it, it is a force multiplier for us. So one of the main um, buybacks that's been in use um, for us downtown is associated with um, DID putting out um, buyback to have officers working in coordination with our police uh, reserves who are volunteers uh, on Nicollet Mall during our busy summer months when we have the joint beats going. The joint beats are, joint beats are a uh, collaboration between MPD, Transit PD, and the head of the county sheriff's department. But the, um, the uh, beats that are being put out with the police reserves, it's essentially helping to fund 
putting out two police officers and four reserves, typically four days a week. Um, and it's able to help create a highly visible public safety presence, presence along Nicollet Mall. Ninth and Nicollet is one of our most challenging areas within the entire first precinct right now. And last year, I just pulled a few stats, um, having those reserves out there, they, uh, with our officers working buyback hours, they did uh, 1,263 citizen contacts, uh, 123 business contacts. They worked a total of 48 days out there, 20, uh, I'm sorry, 36 traffic enforcement contacts. And then they assisted um, all of these other efforts that we have out there with 12 medical events but they're able to assist with behavior uh, health concerns that we have out there. They communicate directly with our safety communication center, the DID safety communication center that's housed out of the first precinct. Um, we do kick those off during the same kind of um, days of the week and hours that our joint beats are going. Um, and we're gonna try starting those earlier this year, but they're working closely with street out outreach teams and DID ambassador uh, program down here. So all of the uh, buyback um, that I, I touched on here we basically use them as a resource multiplier and it's a huge benefit, especially with the, the staffing concerns that we have right now on the MPD. So it's a huge benefit for the MPD. That's all I have, Chief. Does anybody have any questions for me? All right, thank you. Oh. I'd like to go forward then to uh, Commander Kingsbury, who's here to talk about the stadium and public venues for large events. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Director. As far as the stadiums and public venues go, uh, the source of funding comes from the venue itself, like US Bank Stadium or the management company, ASM Global. Maybe it's a specific team like the Timberwolves. So by them contracting with the city, they get services that are normally not available to just general off-duty jobs. These are such things such as SWAT, bomber, canine, which are very specialized areas of the police department. And with that, oftentimes comes potential high liability and or high risk. So because of that, we don't let them work general off-duty jobs. We like to have much more oversight with these high risk, high liability positions. Um, we like to know who's working where, how often they're working, what they're doing, and specifically, you know, the hours that they're working because that tends to be a, sometimes a problem with certain officers in the city. Um, one important thing, like Inspector Peterson uh, elaborated on, was the fact that it's a force multiplier downtown. Having these officers come in voluntarily and work these high liability, high risk positions is very important to not only the safety of the venue itself and those attending the venue, uh, but downtown in general and then the rest of the city. Because if something were to happen somewhere else in the city, we can pull those resources and they're there pretty quick versus if something were to happen, we might be calling in a lot of officers from home, which would create a lag time and a response. So that's definitely beneficial. One important thing to note, especially for the stadiums, is the uh, Safety Act. So that's an uh, act of Congress which provides certification or designation for these large public venues uh, that really just shows that they plan, plan, prepare um, to detect and mitigate any terrorist types atta type attacks. And one of the ways they do that is by staffing these specialty units to perform those services such as bomb or canine EOD detection. Uh, last bullet point there, it's important to note that officers, sergeants, or lieutenants can work this. Uh, the cost to the venue or whoever has the contract with the city is based on their uh, salary or their hour, hour rate. And then fringe benefits, admin costs, and equipment costs are all figured into that and what we end up billing that venue or team, for example. And that's all I have. Next slide, please. So just in general, and I guess a summary, summary of, of some of the points that we've discussed earlier is that we think that there are some very specific benefits of buyback. One that's not on here is just, is just oversight. Uh, by having buyback that's voluntary, we know where the officers are. We are able to pull those officers in in cases of emergency. Um, again, these are voluntary hours but they can be pulled in then to work if something is going on in another part of the city or other part of their precinct. Um, for most, the work complements the operations of the department. Uh, certain buyback allows the office or inspectors and investigators to target crime trends or hotspots. 
Um, this is used in all precincts and all year. So to, to kind of add a little bit what DC4 said about the JAG grants, this is money that comes in through a grant and that's put aside for officers to say, I need, you know, X number of people for the next four weekends because we have uh, increase in burglaries in precinct X. All the precincts um, come up with those plans. They get approval for those plans. Then that uh, money is available for buyback for those particular crime suppression areas or target targeted areas. Uh, this just in general expands the pool of available hours. Buyback can allow for extra patrols or security for areas that might see limited policing, but desire the additional law enforcement services. It provides security for large scale events that would not be available by other means. And it's an efficient way to provide additional staffing for other city projects in other departments. And that's the end of our presentation, but we would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Director McPherson and everyone else who um, gave us this presentation. I think we have Councilmember Payne in the queue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I have a, a, a number of questions, so I'm, I'm a, I'll just start and we'll see what makes the most sense in terms of um, how I address all these questions. But my highest level question is, could you speak more to the difference between standard overtime, buyback over time and off duty work? DC Forts, would you like to take that and I can add anything in from a financial standpoint? Uh, yes, uh, Director McPherson, I will, I'll do my best. Chair Pete, uh, Council Member Payne, uh, thank you for the questions. A standard overtime can come in a variety of ways. It could be um, officers signing up to uh, work a, a shift shortage on a, on a particular um, a shift in a precinct. It could be an officer uh, needing to work late on a case. It could be, uh, which is more, the more common would be a shift holdover that supervisors require officers to have to stay later because to mitigate a certain uh, a, a certain uh, incident that's going on, or or you're on a call that that carries you beyond your normal shift hours, and uh, and that would be I would say standard overtime. It's particular to the person, and I would say the the either them picking up an extra uh, an extra shift, or if we call them back for department related activities, that's a that's standard overtime. Buyback overtime, um, and also I, I should place that standard overtime can be compulsory. We we may force people to work standard overtime. We may and and have and do uh, call people back to duty. Uh, we can tell people you you have to stay late uh, to address departmental needs. So standard overtime can be compulsory, and we can uh, and we can force our employees to 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 utilize. Or I would say to occur that in the in the needs of departmental. Uh, staffing. Uh, buyback overtime is uh, again, it's and, and also standard overtime comes out of the department budget. Um, we're, you know, we, we have to pay for that in terms of uh, from within the department budget. Buyback overtime um, again is this, these are a multitude of things. And, and, you, as, and based upon a lot of our data, a lot of this, um, there's a, there's a lot of utilization again through uh, things like the various uh, stadiums and event venues uh, that require uh, a lot of, they require additional and, spe and specific police duties in order to meet their security uh, requirements to operate the venue. And, but there's a benefit also to the department because uh, these are also high volume events and it's good to have uh, additional public safety presence at these events as well. Uh, the benefit to the city is that the venues are paying for this and, and they, they contract with the city and then we, uh, then the city uh, provides these services, but uh, essentially it's not at uh, the cost to the taxpayer. However, as the department, we, uh, these are again, are voluntary. So people are signing up to work this, whether it be through, uh, a first come first serve basis for some very generalized buyback to those that have specific skill sets that can. 
obviously if uh, there's a buyback that requires a bomb sweep, we need to have people that have bomb tech certification do that. Um, but again, it's voluntary. And as pointed out by uh, Commander Kingsbury, that this is this affords us to have these additional resources on hand. One, to provide that presence and service at, at uh, what we all can argue is a, is a place that needs public safety presence. But two, in, in regards to many of the other uh, buyback uh, opportunities. These are these are resources available for us to call back to duty, or in through I would say the standardized overtime or compulsory we have in certain circumstances, compel people to come back to full duty uh, because they're available in in working within the city. Um, off duty work. <clears throat> this uh, this is uh, essentially more of a of a private contract between the officers and and a and a private business employer and um, that is that is not that, that doesn't go through um, the same process that buyback does in terms of coming you know even coming for the council to review to accept the, the buyback funds um, I will ask director McPherson do you think I I missed anything in in regards to those three? forms of work. No, I think that one of the things maybe I would say with off duty as well is that, you know, we're we're charging a fixed price based on officer the officer rates, the weighted average rate in most cases and in um, off duty, again that contract is really between a business for example and the officers themselves. So there's definitely a difference there. Yes, yes, that's a very good point. Uh, the buyback rate is 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 very much predicated on what uh, what the the rate of pay is, and then a a, a very uh, discernible uh, scale in terms of fringe and, and equipment uh, fees. So it's very, I would say, transparent in the sense of what these uh, what these groups are being charged. Uh, Councilmember Payne, did, did that uh, answer your question, sir? Yeah, that was really helpful. Um... A follow up question is around our policies around overtime. So like this distinction between compulsory overtime and voluntary overtime is really I, I think it's a really meaningful distinction. Mm -hmm. um, do you have the discretion to um, do voluntary overtime outside of the buyback program? Yes, yes, we do. And, and there are there are um, opportunities where uh, and we had we had when we received some fundings and and some of the I would say um, the funding we received as part of the stimulus uh, the stimulus uh, money and we utilized it for for violent crime hotspots details um, that was that was voluntary overtime um, and so we may designate that we would like to uh, we would like officers to focus on a particular area for a particular crime pattern and we will post it and say you know we would like people to sign up and work this if if, you, if, they, if it doesn't get filled we're not going to force people into doing it um there's there's a, a kind of a we, we're we'd like to keep overtime like that voluntary because it works for also from a wellness standpoint and a staffing standpoint um you have to be pretty there has to be a very, I would say, justifiable and discernible public safety need when, before you're compelling people um, to to come to work or to stay late. And uh, and we're very judicious about how we do that. That's really helpful because one of the distinctions I'm trying to make is um, the operational needs that you need to be able to make decisions tactically day to day versus kind of like the financing mechanism of those decisions. And this is very much a financing mechanism, more so I feel than a um, tactical decision making framework. Um, but one of the things from a tactical decision making framework uh, I'm thinking about is um, for overtime, whether buyback or standard overtime, um, or I should say voluntary versus compulsory, uh, when you need to staff up in a certain hot spot area, um, are you limited from a policy perspective to only resource officers within the precinct or can you make those um, 
requests uh, across the entire city, across all precincts. So if, uh, you know, in Ward 1, we have Precinct 2, which is one of the slower precincts. Um, if a hotter precinct, like whether Precinct 3 or 4, needed additional um, folks to show up for a hot spot, is it possible to make a request, whether voluntary or compulsory, for officers um, to come from other precincts for those hot spots and those patrols, or are you limited by precinct? No, we are not limited by precinct. And uh, our precinct commanders and supervisors do, um, I think they they have a, a system in which they, if they have um, additional resource needs that people can come in and work, they offer it in house within the precinct first uh, for a for a, a period of time. And then and if it doesn't get satisfied with an in house ask, they release it citywide for for other other people within the, the other precincts or even in investigative units if they choose to to take that on. Uh, the thought process being obviously the people that work the neighborhoods know the neighborhoods the best and would probably be the best suited to fill those shifts. However, it is offered uh, for for everybody and and buyback again in the same manner. Um, by contract, we have to make sure it's being done in an equitable and fair manner. So it is open for everybody unless there's specific skill sets that are required uh, to fulfill that that buyback contract. And so um, when uh, again, very much understand various hotspots in the city, especially over the last couple of years, very much understand the understand the unique circumstances of um, some of the larger events that we hopefully will, will be returning to um, with some of our mandates shifting and you know COVID response will, allowing people to gather again. Um, how much uh, does the source of the funding play into your decision making when it comes to making those tactical decisions on where you want to allocate resources? If that question makes sense, like, is it in your mind that I need to like tap into buyback dollars for this overtime, or um, I need to use a standard overtime and it's a voluntary standard overtime, or um, is that no, like an after the fact decision? I think that's it's it's part of the decision, but that would be in a, in a conversation that I have with Director McPherson as to what the best source of the funds, what is the best uh, the best mechanism to utilize in order to effectuate. Uh, what we're looking to have. Um, I would say the source of the funding um, generally, if, if there's a discernible need, and and I, I, when I come to Director McPherson with a discernible need for, for additional uh, public safety focus, um, we collaborate and come up with what is the best source of that. And uh, uh, Director, if, there, if you'd like to chime in on that. Yeah, I guess just one comment to make on that, Council Member, is that um, the source of the funding is because we want to analyze what our, I guess what I would say is our, our regular overtime um, versus these hotspots, I will try to use things like grant funds to cover those hotspot areas just because then I can segregate those. We can pull those out and say exactly what that's being used for. So for things like, this, especially with stimulus funding or these JAG funds or things, it's really important that we we are able to then go back to whatever the federal agency is or state agency that's providing those funds and really show what those funds are being used for. And so that's a, that's a good way to be able to do that. And would that analysis happen, uh, you know, when you're making payroll as a kind of after the fact, or is that analysis done prior to making the request for overtime? When it's a when it's a special and DC Force jump in, I didn't mean to I didn't mean to cut you off or anything. But when it when it's a special request like that, like if an officer comes to me or I'm sorry, an inspector comes to DC Force and myself and says, you know, they want to have a, a unit or a group that does three weekends in a row to address some particular problem that's done up front yeah that way because in in, the, in these regards then a special overtime code will be set up for that particular task it will have a designated approver and it'll have a start date and an end date uh, in some regards so as director mcpherson uh described it's easily parsed out and and uh and when it comes to where did that money go and for what purpose and then um, 
are there currently budget constraints for us using standard overtime, voluntary standard overtime to do some of those more strategic um, deployments right now? And we need this buyback dollars to, to make up a budget shortfall or is the, the buyback dollars kind of a nice to have bonus on top of our, our current? So I, if you don't mind, I'd love to answer that question. <laughs> so if you've looked at, uh, and yeah, I see this every day, right? So, um, but if you look at our overtime dollars over the last four or five years, you'll notice that there, there's been a significant increase in overtime. Um, a lot of that over the last couple of years is obviously because of events that have played out as well as just our staffing numbers. But our overtime for 2021 is just under $12 million. It's never been that high before. Um, and that's just our regular, you know, this is what we need to be able to do the mission of the department. So um, from that standpoint, these other items allow us to address other things that are important to us, but are not necessarily just meeting the needs or basic needs of public safety within the um, the city itself. So I think a lot of things, you know, we would not be able to do some of the things that we do right now uh, without those extra dollars currently. Now, if we our staffing was back to numbers, you know, uh, better numbers and things that may change in the future. But I can't recall a time since I've been here where we've had an abundance of overtime dollars to do the work that is not necessarily the emergency work or the priority of the 911 response, but these other items that really complement the work that we're doing on a daily basis. Do you see fours? No, I would I would have to agree with you, uh, Director. It's it, the um, a lot of the the overtime has been to address uh, circumstances of uh, reduced staffing and staffing shortage, but also uh, over the last two years of of uh, you know operating a 24/7 organization during the during the pandemic, and when uh, when you would see uh, when cases of COVID would be very high in the community, they were very high amongst our workforce, and and it was not unheard of to get. Uh, dozens of notifications a day of staff that essentially could not come to work for 10 days. And, uh, and you, you would be no way to prepare for that. And so we would have to lean a lot on on overtime to help uh, to help try to maintain uh, you know, safe staffing levels uh, in, in light of kind of a, a chaotic a situation where you don't really know what your staffing is going to be. Yeah, no, I that definitely um, resonates with me, and I can only imagine, given the staffing um, realities, how much we need to uh, utilize overtime. Uh, are there restrictions on how we can use overtime in our current policies that are a barrier to be to meeting those needs? Um, not that I'm aware of, uh, Director. I don't know if there's any sort of. I'm not aware of. I mean, overtime. I think that to, I would have to. I would have to do a deep dive into that, but not that I'm overtly aware of. Yeah, I I would agree. I don't think there are either, but um, I guess I've never really been asked that question in that way, so I would have to think about that a little bit too. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to. I'd like to point out also that some of the grant work that we do, I think, is while it's not our daily operations, it's obviously very important and important for to the city as well. Uh, we have grants that provide extra hours for child exploitation, for human trafficking, you know, some really extremely important aspects of law enforcement and for city, and city safety and security. Um, those dollars and, and that work may not be available very readily without the support of the federal and state funding that we get, the extra federal and state funding that we get. Yeah, I think um, I, I, I this presentation was really helpful for me because I'd certainly make a distinction between um, federal grant dollars and private organizations making you know additional requests for patrols. And I'm, I'm trying to make that distinction um, because the, uh, the buyback program seems to be the financial mechanism by which we accept federal dollars to do some of this 
um, supporting work. So that part, I'm making a, certainly a distinction uh, between. Um, one of the questions that I had when the last time we had a buyback program come up in front of this body was around officer burnout. And I was able to, and I just wanted to do more homework and I was able to come across um, a 2019 audit around our off duty time. And in that uh, report, I did see that we do limit the total number of hours that an officer can work in a seven day period. I think that's at 64 hours, but we don't restrict um, the amount of hours you can work in a day. So you can only work, work up to 24 hours in a day, which there's no more hours left in a day to work. Uh, and you don't, there's no requirement around um, a rest period between those hours. And I'm just wondering, uh, you know, one of the takeaways from that audit was around our capacity to track off duty hours and um, have oversight and compliance around some of those hours worked. And I'm wondering, um, could it, it, are there any updates from the, the, you know, the audits from 2019, the before times, before, uh, you know, COVID, before the civil unrest, before, you know, the, the, the huge changes in our staffing levels. Um, and there were some pretty specific recommendations within the audit around um, improving our technology around hours tracking, having stronger requirements around off-duty work requirements and the compliance to those requirements. Um, I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're kind of in a, a different world from the time that that audit happened. Were we able to implement any of those recommendations from the audit? Um, and if so, can, can you share a status update on where that is? I'll be, uh, council member, I'll be happy to jump in a little bit, but I will probably need some, some assistance from the chiefs who are on the call. Um, right now, we, you're right, it was a different day and age uh, a few years ago. Uh, in 2019 or 2020, we started a project. We have a proprietary uh, software for scheduling called Workforce Director, and we started a project to convert that to another system. The reason being is that it was out of date. It's all about a 20 year old, again, proprietary software program. Um, it was no longer up, upgraded or updated. It wasn't supported and it was going to cost millions of dollars to actually update at that point. So that was one of the projects for 2020. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, that was one of the items that was cut or deferred, I should say, that was put back in the budget for 2022. So this is a long way of saying that we really don't have the system capacity right now or capability for off-duty work to track it. However, uh, we are looking at software to purchase specifically for off-duty. We've had some vendors who have come in, we're in the process right now of writing an RFP, which I would assume would be out probably in, I'd say three weeks, something around that time period. And so we are trying to address the ability of keeping track in a holistic manner of the number of hours that officers are working. We do not yet have that capability of doing that. But uh, um, I guess a follow-up question is that if they are doing either um, standard overtime or buyback overtime, we, we we are tracking those hours? That is correct. Okay. Did DC um, Force, any other, did do you have anything else to add or? Uh, no, nothing, nothing uh, substantial beyond what you said, Robin. I know the uh, the interim chief wanted uh, people to know that she is she is working on this and it is in progress. Um, we may have to have an update on that at a at a later time. But. I don't think I have any more questions. I, I'll, I'll I'll leave the queue open for others if they want to jump in. Thank you, Vice Chair Payne. Council Member Wansley Warlawa. Thank you, Chair Vita. Um, I just had a couple of questions regarding, um, you know, and this is, is this is an ongoing conversation. I mean, we just had this last week around OBP of just crystallizing more transparency about the roles of, of all of our public safety workers, uh, because often that can be misinterpreted uh, by the public. Um, and one aspect that's kind of showing up in this conversation is around when officers are showing up um, on an off-duty job and then also on the, the buyback side. So um, when officers are showing up 
on the off-duty job. You know, they're bringing their uniform, the gun, um, often a squad car paid for by Minneapolis, you know, taxpayers. And the public sees these officers in uniforms and will likely assume that they're on duty. Um, but if they're a part of this buyback program or if they're being contracted, with, you know, privately with the business, can you share how the back buyback program was created as a, a different process than the standard off-duty work? Because the public will likely not know the difference. I can't address why this was set up initially. Again, it's been in existence for probably 20 plus years, um, but I do believe that there is, I think has been the feeling that if extra security is required for a venue or, or a neighborhood that they should be absorbing the cost that really for those, especially for profit companies and things like that, that that's not really the the up to necessarily um, taxpayer dollars. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question directly. Yeah, let me rephrase because I mean even in the buyback, even though it's private organizations that's you know contracting these services, these are again that the the taxpayer dollars again the perception of officers showing up either in uniform are they wearing different uniforms are they not bringing their uniforms when they're performing these buyback uh you know services no they're wearing their uniforms and uh, we are charging the venues or the uh, organization for the cost of equipment that's built into the charge okay and i think some of this too is just also clarity of why aren't private contracts like these buyback, you know, contracts? Why are those not coming through the council um, to have a public and transparent process? So buyback contracts do come through council. So I assume you're talking about off duty. Yes, those the private contracts off duty. Yes. Okay. I DC Force can you, or DC Wait can you address the off duty? Sure. So thank you, council member. I so your question is how they are hired on then or exactly what because there is the buyback is varies greatly from the off duty positions that people hold. And so could you ask more specifically yeah. that? Thank I, think, you. I think creating for me and because we've had a the early part of the conversations around some of the lack of clarity of when officers are performing um, off-duty work, is there a process that guides that that is different than the buyback? Um, because from the public, if you're off-duty and you're showing up in uniform, that's not known that you're off-duty. Through the buyback, where it, thank you for providing that clarifying you know, response that we're charging that. But let's say, again, if an officer is off-duty, engages in a level of misconduct, like we can't do we just say oh that was off duty like just trying to clarify like what is the 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 strains of process that separates these two sure i'll do my best <laughs> so if someone is just to address the last thing you had mentioned if someone is in a uniform and they're involved in an action that falls under question that case will be handled by internal affairs. It doesn't matter what that officer is doing, whether they're working buyback, whether they're working their regular assignment, uh, regardless, it, it's going to be handled through um, the internal affairs and OPCR process. Um, as far as how, are you asking how they are hired then through buyback versus off-duty is kind of what I think you're getting at. And so um, again, buyback really, it varies just as we had previously explained. So some of the buyback is really focused on people that have a specific skill set. Say for example, um, someone that has a canine that is a bomb detector dog. And so they are working a very specific assignment that I couldn't work that assignment because I don't have that skill set. I haven't gone through that training, but an officer that is currently in the canine unit and has the bomb detector dog could do that work. So 
it's sometimes very dependent on skill set. Other times, uh, as DC Force had explained and Inspector Peterson, it could be a situation where there's buyback avail available because there's um, maybe there's a need in the precinct. There's the JAG money available. There's enhanced patrol efforts in that specific geographic area where they're experiencing a spike in a criminal activity where that additional buyback dollars would help support having a, another officer on patrol in that area to address that specific crime. So that does that help a little bit with that piece of it? Yeah, I think, you know, overall what I'm hearing here, I know this presentation today was to highlight, you know, the buyback program, um, but I also know with some of the comments raised by Council Member Payne that there's also, you know, how are we comparing the process or around the buybacks to off-duty police work? Um, and like I know, noted, again, from the public eyes, you know, you just see an officer in uniform. You don't know that they're doing off-duty work or that they're being contracted through this external uh, officer. So creating more transparency around that and creating more of, you know, through that transparency, showing the distinctions between um, when officers are showing up in off-duty and when they're showing up performing, you know, the specific functions of the buyback. And I think if anything, it would be great uh, if we could have a presentation on the off-duty contract before, you know, PHS to just get a little bit more clarity about that. Um, so I totally get that part. I would like to, you know, have that presentation done in the future. I can segue to the next question that I had. Um, I, I could yeah. please add yeah. one thing. If anybody out there sees someone dressed like this in a uniform, they're always available to help community. It doesn't matter if they're working buyback or they're working an off-duty job or they're out on patrol. If you see a uniform, you can certainly ask them for help and they'll be more than happy to assist. Thank you, Director McPherson. Oh, sorry, not McPherson. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so next question um, that was uh, coming up for me is around the, the staffing um, concerns. You know, we've heard, of course, you know, you all shared that today. MPD is short staff. Um, and last month, this committee also received the MPD staffing study um, and, you know, wanting to highlight just based off of that report that, you know, under the current model of shift assignments, um, that report says that the MPD current staffing levels um, is it's been identified as appropriate. So under this assumption, you know, that patrol officers are expected to spend half of their time responding to calls uh, for service. Um, I'm still a little confused of how the buyback, you know, programs actually adds additional capacity um, to our staff. It seems like you're drawn from the same pool of already like constrained, tired staff, <laughs> short staff. Um, so I'm also very much interested in how does this impact, you know, the widening racial inequities um, around how we're providing public safety services. Um, so I also noted that there was not a REIA um, on this RCA. So I would love to know, has have you all done analysis of um, the racial impacts of this model? So uh, this is Robin, uh, Council Member. Um, thanks for the question. So uh, I'm not if I've missed something, let let me know. Um, the racial equity there is actually one um, in the the three that were uh, RCAs that were put in for this particular um, council. Uh, uh, I believe it was the one on one of the SMG ones. And the reason that was done is because it was not part of the budget. It's, it was extra or extra money. Our buyback is part of the, the budget. It was approved through the budget process. So that was included within the equity analysis that was done through the budget process. So, and even the SMG ones were all part of the 2022 budget as they have been in past years, but the dollar amounts are higher because now these venues are thinking that because of the end of the pandemic, hopefully um, that those numbers will will increase. So that has been done. I think when I talk about the um, the increase in the pool, and Inspector Peterson may have more to to talk about this since he's out in the precincts themselves. But 
the increases because these officers would not be compelled to work this overtime. This is voluntary overtime. And so, you know, we don't know what they do on their off hours. So the fact that they're willing to work additional hours on off hours in a voluntary basis does add to our pool of total number of overtime. Oh, you're mute. No, just clarity to overtime, oh. just not to actual additioning staffing. Oh, support. correct. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I wasn't sure with someone else also getting on. I saw on my screen shift. <laughs> Okay, I will ask my next question. Uh, can you describe the contracting uh, vetting process that is used for organizations um, outside of the sports sporting events that you all identify, you know, that participate in this program? You know, how does it compare to the process that we use around RFPs? So the RFPs that the police department uses are primarily for expenses for something that we're trying to buy so or or con contract with something that is provided to us where these are the opposite these are places coming to us and saying we would like to contract with you so it doesn't go through an RFP process what it does do is if there is a group that is interested in having the police department provide buyback or security services, safety services. They will normally, and this is typical, will go to an officer or the inspector of the precinct and ask for buyback. They will, they will, I guess, show them what they're looking for, work with the inspector. The inspector then would approve it the uh, inspector would then work with the deputy chief and the deputy chief would come to my group and say, I approve this, we want to do this. Uh, then we would do the contracting. I would do the contracting side of it. Awesome. I just wanted to know if there was in that you've laid that out like a vetting process in place, even when the request is coming through to MPD. Um, just based off of what is in, included in that request? Uh, I would have to ask the inspectors what information they're getting from that. From a, it, it does have to be a legal entity. Um, that is one thing. And uh, But Inspector Peterson or DC Force, if you could answer. I will. Uh, I will uh, Sorry, the inspectors don't need to step over you. I've seen limited numbers of these come through. Most of the, the buyback contracts, in, in my experience, have already been well established. Um, inspector, anything that, that you have seen from, from one from thing? One from one thing. No, I was going to add the same thing, Chief. If you look at the list that uh, Director McPherson has provided, the vast majority of um, these uh, buyback programs that are on here, they've been established for quite some time. Um, I've been on the department for uh, 20, 26 years now, and I can remember buyback being uh, in existence when, when I was a young officer. So it has been around for a while. And like I said, if I look through this list, virtually all of them on here have been in existence for quite some time. I personally, uh, in my almost two and a half years as an inspector, have not dealt with gaining approval for a new buyback program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, echo there. Um, and of course, I know we're having a continuous conversation around accountability, especially in relates to public safety workers um, when, and when they engage in misconduct, what is the process for that? So just highlighting kind of earlier, um, similar to the off-duty uh, work, if an officer engages in misconduct while on a buyback shift, are they then excluded from future buyback contracts? I would answer on that. I mean, I think that there has been experience and the inspectors have the capacity to exclude people from from working uh, 
discretionary overtime, depending upon um, if there's allegations or, or I would say substantiated misconduct. However, all allegations of misconduct would go through uh, the traditional vetting process, uh, either through OPCR or internal affairs, as, as it would if someone was on duty. Awesome. Those are all the questions I have. Thank you all. Thank you, Council Member Wansley Wallabaugh. Is there any further discussion? Council Member Palmasano. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think this has been covered in a few different ways, but because I've had um, the responsibility of having several conversations with people in the community about more recent buyback kinds of programs. I think there's a lot of confusion about it. Um, you know, essentially the public's take when I'm at neighborhood meetings is saying, you know, if there are officers to buy back, then why aren't we, the city, buying them back for more proactive policing in hotspots in areas of the greatest need? I think the answer is we are already doing that. Um, but could you just help me to um, smooth that out and add some context around it? Because I think there's great confusion in the community about these buyback programs still. Thank you. Uh, council committee chair and council council member, I'll be happy to, to start if uh, one of the deputy chiefs or inspector would be interested in jumping in. Uh, yes, there is overtime, including buyback, going to hotspots. So there is both. Um, there are stimulus dollars that are going to hotspots as well. Uh, the, uh, the primary funding within buyback for hotspots is through the JAG grants. And then we also have some neighborhood revitalization program funding that is also being used for buyback. Um, again, though, the, the uh, inspectors clearly have the discretion to use regular overtime to go to use that for hotspots as well. This just provides us additional funding, additional monies to do that much more. Yeah, and I, I can jump in here uh, as well. So the, I mean, one of the, the differences is that with off-duty and buyback, um, what we're trying to do is attract officers who are, are essentially off-duty rather than spending time uh, at home with families and, and doing things of their own personal interest to get them to come into the city um, to put on the uniform. And anytime that they are in this uniform, they are held to all of the standards of our policies and procedures. It doesn't matter whether they're off duty, working buyback, regular overtime or on duty. Uh, anytime they're putting this uniform on, they are held to those standards. And then if there is disciplinary issues like DC4 said, those work through internal affairs, OPCR and other avenues. But um, it, anyway, I look at it, if I can get an officer into the city to be um, working off duty, if I can get them into the city to be working buyback, if I can get them into the city to work just the standard overtime shifts that we put out there, it, it's a benefit for me as a precinct in, uh, inspector because of our, our current staffing levels. Uh, in my opinion, that staffing study, um, you know, needs to be challenged because I feel that we're drastically understaffed. As a precinct inspector, I am being drugged to meeting, to meeting, to meeting. People are concerned about response times, concerned about not seeing cops. I uh, personally downtown, I've lost um, community response team members. There's three precincts within the city that don't have a cert teams. I lost my day beat. I used to have 16 officers and a sergeant on a day beat that provided a foot beat presence in, in the core of downtown. They're gone. So I'm putting out overtime um, and starting it earlier and earlier every year because of the staffing shortages to provide a presence on um, Nicollet Mall, on Hennepin and other areas of, of uh, downtown. And some of that is on just straight overtime. We're putting out overtime to try to get uh, replacement officers for those that are, that are missing. Other, um, you know, 
other events, whether it's uh, you know football games, baseball games, winter classic, whatever have you, that stuff is attracting officers to come in and buy back. And then there's plenty of venues in downtown where officers are coming in, whether it's working directly at Target, Walgreens, um, you know, different different bars and beats and stuff in the downtown there where officers are working off duty. Anytime those officers are in here, we do have the ability, if a major incident pops off, um, to put them on duty and use utilize those resources and personnel as we need to to deal with any number of uh, incidents that are, that arise. So I hope that information um, is, is along the lines of what you're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Palmasano. Is there any discussion, any further discussion? Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Chair Vita. I just want to echo uh, for the public record that I did too read the staff report. And what that report told me is not only are we short patrol officers, we're short investigators, probably 100. We do not have a traffic unit. We do not have beat cops. We do not have any community policing efforts. Uh, no more bike uh, cops for kids. So uh, depending on how you read that report, you have a difference of opinion. My opinion is that we are in a crisis with our staffing. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rainville. Council Member Ellison. <clears throat> uh, thank you. And yeah, I, I want to make sure that we're, we're not reversing course on, you know, taking seriously data-driven approaches to, to how we understand the enterprise. I think the staffing study is a data-driven approach that should be um, studied and respected. And, and certainly there's a lot of information in there. Um, I, 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 I think, uh, yeah, you could cherry pick the information if you wanted to, but I think it's a, it's a full report, um, really complex and nuanced. I think, I think people should, should dive into. Uh, I just wanted to say that I think that the, the, um, uh, Councilmember Payne raised a, a question uh, back when we we were discussing this issue some some cycles ago, around uh, and this isn't necessarily for the police department staff, but around whether or not we offer a similar service like this in other realms of the city, or is this incongruent with how we treat other departments? Um, and uh, and I think it's a good question, and I think it's it's good to know how the program works, um, and uh, and it's good to have our professional staff on here to come and explain to us how the program works, but I still think that that larger question, that, that, that question of zooming out and asking, you know, what similar, in what similar ways does our institution function like this elsewhere uh, is still a really good question. I don't have, um, you know, answers to that. Um, and I wasn't expecting this presentation to answer that, but I just wanted to lift that up as, as, um, as, as a really compelling sort of, um, uh, good governance discussion, uh, you know, topic that uh, Councilmember Payne brought up. Um, do we allow the rest of the institution to function in this way, or is this just a program that is so critically unique to the police department? I think it's a good question, uh, and and I, I would love for us to, you know, have an answer to that question at some point. Um, obviously, that that starts with gaining an understanding of the buyback buyback program itself. So, just wanted to note that for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ellison. Council Member Payne. Yeah, I would just like to um, lift up what Inspector Peterson, Peterson was raising around. Um, there's just a need uh, in the city, and we want to make sure as policymakers that you have the resources necessary to meet that need. Um, and that's just a broad statement. And I think that uh, we should certainly use the staffing study and that data-driven approach to make sure that um, we're validating that need from a data-driven perspective. But I think that um, that perspective on the ground is really important. And I just wanna lift up what um, Vice President Palmasano had to say of, I believe it's our job uh, as policymakers and as, as the folks who need to approve the budget that you have the resources you need to deliver the safety that we want for our community. And I'm making that as a distinction from this buyback program. I heard today um, that we don't have restrictions on overtime. And so if we need to get some more folks on the ground, 
we should be, I think we should be using city dollars to do that. And I think that we should be having an honest conversation with our constituents about where their tax dollars are going and what services they're delivering. And that um, if our constituents want more uniformed officers, we should be staffing accordingly with our tax dollars and taxing accordingly. So um, I think today I won't be supporting the buyback contracts, but I do support making sure that we are giving the resources necessary to deliver the services that we need across every department. Thank you, Council Member Payne. Is there any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, I'll direct the clerk to receive and file this report. We're moving on to item five. Item five is authorizing a revenue contract with SMG to provide law enforcement equipment at US Bank Stadium. Is there any discussion on this item? Uh, with that, I'll move for approval of item number five. Oh, sorry, Council Member Wansley Warlobaugh. Thank you, my apologies. I was going through windows trying to get to the chat. Um, thank you so much, uh, Chair Vita. I just had a couple of questions about uh, five. Um, could one of our staff that's on the call explain the re relationship between the city the stadium and the private contractors. Basically, why why is U.S. Bank contracting with a private company through the city? Like, is there a law that does not allow them to just contract with these uh, directly with these these private companies without the city as an intermediary? Committee Chair, uh, Council Member. So this contract is actually with between the police department or the city and a company called SMG. SMG is the actual manager of the venue and for the Vikings. So they are responsible for the safety and security and for running the safety and security, which is why we contract with them. Thank you so much for that. And just a follow up uh, question, are the officers that's gonna be you know, providing these services, are they um, SMG employees? Um, or do they have a relationship with MPD? No, the, the officers who are, or I'm sorry, the people who are providing the service at the stadium are MPD officers. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on item number five. Councilmember Wansley Warlaba? Nay. Councilmember Rainville? Aye. Councilmember Ellison? No. Councilmember Palmasano? Aye. Vice Chair Payne? No. Chair Vita? Aye. There are three ayes and three nays. Can you hear me? Hello. We can hear you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I don't know what's happening. My computer is freezing. I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the the clerk. Did that item carry? There were three eyes and three nays. So that fails. Madam Chair, that's that's correct. The the motion fails. So at this point, a new motion would be in order um, in order to dispense with the item. So someone could uh, move to send the item forward without recommendation, uh, move to recommend denial of the item, or potentially make a different motion altogether. Council Member Palmasano is uh, making a new motion. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I would suggest that we continue conversation on this offline, but to move this forward without recommendation to full council. Perhaps that would have the support of uh, our committee members today. Thank you. So we have a motion. Second. So will the clerk call the roll on the new motion? Council member Wansley Warlaba. Aye. Council member Rainville. Aye. Council member Ellison. Aye. Council member Palmisano. Aye. Vice Chair Payne. Aye. And Chair Vita. Aye. That carries. Aye. Yes. Thank you. We the next item we have is item number six, and it is authorizing a revenue contract with SMG for SWAT security services at US Bank. Is there any discussion on this item? Or I'm getting a different idea of uh, potentially just forwarding five, six, and seven without recommendation. I second that. Will the clerk please call the roll on forwarding five, five, six, and five, six, seven, and eight without recommendation? Oh, I apologize. I was muted. Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Palmisano. Aye. Vice Chair Payne. Aye. And Chair Vita. Aye. There are six ayes. That carries. And that is the end of our business. Seeing no further business before us and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. <laughs>